प्रसार भारती अभिलेखा गार की प्रस्तुति सदा बहार सुनहरे दौर का अनमोल खजाना Just imagine this scenario in the early 30s. Sound had arrived in full blast, and within just a few years, multi-track recording was made possible. Walt Disney had even managed to start editing to a pre-recorded score of music, and casting professionals had to identify hundreds of artists who were good, talented, could talk, who could sing, and even dance well to entertain the needs of the growing industry. So, producers in Los Angeles, Hollywood, did not have to think too hard to find their talents. They had to just come to these theaters and find the dancers and the singers. But they needed a first-rate choreographer who could really deliver the goods in a cinematic way and not make it look too theatrical. Of course, they had people like Ernst Lubitsch and Ruben Mamoulian who had done song sequences in their earlier films, but. That's really not the kind of musical sequences which these studio moguls had in mind. And in answer to their prayers, came a man called Busby Berkeley. As a matter of fact, the first talkie itself was a musical. It itself, the, the name itself is a jazz singer. And uh, if you look back at the jazz singer film now, only the singing part of it is in talkie. And the rest of it is silent, where he sings the song Mammy and things like that. So it was, they thought that the musical would lend itself to very good adaptation on screen. Born in 1895, Busby came from an extremely accomplished theatrical family but did not have too much of a formal training in choreography. And before he could get too attached to New York's musical Broadway, Samuel Goldwyn hijacked him away to Los Angeles to arrange dance scenes for his films. And in 1933, Warner Brothers picked him out and made successful films like 42nd Street and The Gold Diggers and with that Busby became a household name in the field of cinema choreography. asking too much. Will you please show me a little? All right, now, once again, give it something. Come on, ready, Jerry? Get into it now. Come on. The secret of his success seems to be careful planning and a meticulous detail attention to things like costumes, music, camera, and decor. With the help of ace cameraman called Sol Polito, he devised a camera boom which could crane and move on monorails in any direction that he wanted. With this way, he could devise those extremely beautiful top angle shots. Busby loved the overhead shots, for only there he could form and watch the formations of the dance sequences, something which audiences could never see in theatres like these.
musicals were just not song dance sequences like the way we watch on MTV today. But they did revolve around a kind of plot, a kind of threadbare story in which problems would be based on careers in singing, dancing or acting. Well, thanks, I'm trying. Say, I was so scared that first day I walked around the block four times before I had courage enough to even come and apply for this job. I know it's tough, but you'll get along. Well, I wouldn't mind if I could only get that routine set. Listen, sister, I'll show you those taps. Come on with me. Tabs? To pay a little more attention to the narrative element, was the hallmark of the films of Fred Astaire. Although the films did not credit him with the direction of the final work, but you knew that it was Fred Astaire all the way. When you watch his films like The Gay Divorce in 1934 and Swing Time in 1936, you will see that his films somehow revolve around a comic plot with songs and dances interpolated in a stylized way. And thanks to his association with the ever-smiling Ginger Rogers, his films always brought the enthusiasm in the audience to its maximum extent. This has another historical sociological reason in America. You know, in 1929, they had the Wall Street crash, what is called the Great Crash. And that affected the American economy, the Great Depression. And it had, in its turn, impact on the entire world. Even India was affected. So Hollywood producers were essentially very good businessmen, but with a cinematic vision. They were not just money spinners, money makers. So they thought this musical would uh, bring them back and keep them in theatres so that their frustrations, hunger could be uh, easily satisfied or at least consoled for that moment. So that was the reason why this American musical took strong roots.
all said and done this specific art of the melodrama that is the inventive inclusion of song and dance numbers into a regular story narrative form was perfected to the last T by none other than the filmmakers in India. It looked like as if Indian cinema was just waiting for sound to arrive and the gates were opened for singing stars from everywhere to come and join the studio floors. These very singing stars who had looked down upon the cinema art form as something very inferior during the silent days now joined the noisy bandwagon and raised themselves to glorious heights. The excitement is most visible in Kalidasa, the first talkie to be made in Tamil language. Imperial Films its producers and HM Reddy was its director. So excited were they in doing this film that they had all kinds of actors recruited for this film. They did not even know whether the actors could speak Tamil language. So when the film was finally released, it had dialogues in Tamil, Telugu, Urdu and even English. It had 50 songs and literally several cinema theatres all over South India were born with this film. The Bengali film Chandidas, on the other hand, manages to infuse a dose of realism about contemporary caste problems in India by getting the story to revolve around this famous 15th century Vaishnavite Bhakti poet. This film was based on a very successful musical play by Aparesh Mukherjee and tells the story about the love affair between Chandidas and a very low caste washerwoman called Rami. The conflict emerges when a rich merchant sets his eyes upon this low caste washerwoman Rami. Rami refuses to accept his offers. So the merchant decides to wreak vengeance on Chandidas by getting the high priest of the village to ostracize Chandidas out of the village. When Chandidas sees the poor plight of this washerwoman, he cannot tolerate it and so he leaves the village and the institutionalized form of religion forever and walks towards a new tomorrow. Look. 
The success of Chandidas provokes one to see connections between the vibrant Bhakti movement in Indian history and the liking of the people for such musical narratives. Chandidas also saw the introduction of the singing legend Casey Day. This blind singing minstrel used to appear in all his films like the Greek chorus, like an aside who tells a new story to awaken the audience. With the coming of the talkies, films were made in specific languages and therefore that restricted the audiences to specific linguistic zones. We are now in front of the first 70 mm recording theatre in India, where songs and music tracks are continuously churned by the hour. And it is these songs that manage to transcend all barriers of languages in India and get audiences together. In fact, audiences come to theatres just to listen to the songs. And doesn't the tradition continue until this day? With the arrival of the talkies, it suddenly became prestigious for members of the theatre to come and pour out their repertories on the screen. And of course, it was the easiest thing to do for the producers to look at their talent and use their place on the screen. The singing cinema was an obvious product of the musical place. But the person who gave a new standard to this form of melodrama was by profession a typewriter salesman. At heart, he was a Sufi poet, and his name was Kundanlal Saigar. In the singing tradition of the Khotas, where the singing of ghazals is taken to a new level of perfection, Kundanlal Saigal joined the new theatres under the tutelage of R.C. Boral, who was to compose most of his songs. And together with director P.C. Barua and writer Sarachandra Chatterjee, Kundanlal Saigal gave a new definition to the role of Devdas. <laughs> This novel about an idealistic yet indecisive reactionary Indian male stereotype was transformed into a unique poetic tragedy by Kundanlal Saigal. Possibly it was his upbringing in 
the Sufi tradition that managed to get Saigal to understand this character with more compassion. But it was in the south where Indian musical cinema was going to become a force to reckon with. Most of them recorded their songs live in the studios. Some of them pre-recorded their songs in recording theatres and played back on the location. And in the forefront was the very famous nationalist stage group called the TKS Brothers. Not unique to Tamil film industry alone. It is an universal phenomenon. Even in America, stage people, they shifted to film line. Then in England, Lawrence Olivier, John Gilgate, Richard Burton, they all migrated to film industry. Then uh, in Andhra, a lot of uh, stage people, they entered the film industry. In Kannada, they met me idol Rajkumar. He was a stage actor earlier with uh, Gubbi Virana's company. And in, Tel in Marathi, Bengali, it will be the same wherever it because they thought, they, as I already told you, the filmmakers thought the stage personalities can del deliver the goods, deliver the dialogues properly. But the most sensational star among them all was M.K. Tyagaraja Bhagavadar. Sporting shoulder length long hair, diamond studded earrings and rings all over his fingers. This one man was to achieve superstar status in just 11 films. It was with Ambikapati that Tyagaraja Bhagavadar became the immortal hero in 1937. This film this historical film was shot in the new theatre studios at Calcutta in a very, very grand manner and it was directed by Ellis Duncan. Curiously, the Marathi cinema came back to the very first subject that Indian cinema was launched with, namely Raja Harish Chandra. Made in 1931 as Ayodhya Charaja, it was directed by V. Shantaram. Besides having songs sung by Govindra Thembe, and Durga Khote, it had a very strong expressionist influence of the early German silent cinema. Undoubtedly, the most powerful example of such an aesthetic is Sant Tukaram. This film made in 1936 at the Prabhat Studios and directed by Fatil Alad Damle manages to capture the powerful bhakti movement which Sant Tukaram managed to encapsulate. This film captures the earthy realism of the saint poet and blends it beautifully with his mystical journeys. <laughs> At a very simple level, the most glorious example is the life of Meera, the story of Meera Bai, the saint poet. It was played by Chandravati Devi in Bengali, M.S. Subalakshmi in Tamil, Durga Kote in Hindi, and after that, several times in Hindi, until as recently as 1979, when it was played by none other than Hema Malini. Now 
Why was this film made so many times? What is the connection between the Bhakti movement and making of films like these? With these thoughts, I leave you to find more connection in the development of Indian mainstream cinema. So, till we meet again, goodbye.